Alright, welcome back everyone. So today, part three of our project series looking at dynamic particle systems using attractors. Today we're going to be focusing on post, and specifically on a technique for creating really crisp particle trails uh, that looks a lot like feedback, um, but using a completely separate technique that I think, <clears throat> especially for stuff like this, results in a much cleaner, more varied across depth, um, just crisper trailing effect. So that's using the Texture 3D Top. Uh, we're going to get into that in just a second. And then once we kind of have this set up, we are going to do some additional post processing um, that's just going to make our resulting image pop a little bit and set us up for a lot of success in the final couple tutorials of this series, which are going to be bringing everything together by integrating our attractors and then adding some additional functionality and thinking about how to go from effect to project. So, uh, without further ado, I'm going to actually just delete this component, wire this back in. Uh, this should be exactly where we left off our last tutorial. So if you guys haven't been following along the project series so far um, and, and want to, I highly recommend going back and starting from step one. Uh, you can get this component uh, if you do not have time or prefer to simply grab off Patreon. All of these files are available on Patreon for any of my integrator or hire uh, supporters. By the way, thank you all very much. Um, Alright, so now we can just get into things for this effect. So I'm actually going to insert an operator, and I'm just going to insert a base. We'll do all of our work in this base, so I'm going to call this uh, Tex3D Feedback Pass. We'll jump in here. And we'll start looking at our effect. Now, one thing I'm going to do before I start working on this is just make sure that my resolution is something reasonable. So I normally run in 4K when I'm recording this, so everything's real nice and crisp. I'm going to turn that down to just Full HD or Ultra HD, I guess, for reasons which will become apparent shortly. Um, okay. So what is a texture 3D top and how can we use it to achieve what we're looking for? <clears throat> a texture 3D top, if I wire this in, we can start to get a sense of what's going on here. And actually, I'm going to maybe have something a little bit simpler. For illustration. So I'm going to make a quick <clears throat> example here. I'm going to have an LFO. That LFO I'm just going to drop on to the red channel. Uh, I'm going to make the offset 0.5, the amplitude 0.5, and then we can see the color of this changing. Um, I'm going to do another one. I'm going to set the phase to something different. Or actually, I think I can set two channels, R and G, and then have the phase be me dot chan index. I believe works. Uh, times two. Thought that worked. can look at the docs quick. Chan index can be used in any parameter to give a different value for each channel being generated, for example, three, four, five, me chan index. So maybe we can take that and see what 
happens here. Point 0.5 times, there we go, there we go. So now we're doing point 0.5 times our channel index uh, for our phase, which will just give us two channels that are phasing in slightly different times. I'll make it point 0.15 so they're more like this. And then I'm just gonna drag and drop an R and a G channel onto my uh, color. I'm gonna make the rect a little bit smaller and then I'm gonna make the center X abs time. That seconds double divide one minus 0 0.5. So that's going to uh, not divide by one mod one. So that is basically just going to loop from negative 0.5 to 0.5 every second, getting our block that's changing color across the screen. Now, I'm going to wire this in for now, and now we can see much better what's happening on our text 3D top. Especially if I change the cache size to something like 100, or maybe 60. We are essentially getting one texture per frame of our input. So if I change the background color to something totally different using this and jump back in here, I mean now this is crazy, but we can see exactly what's happening. Every frame, our color changes a little bit, our box moves a little bit, and our text 3D top is constantly updating, uh, recording an array of the last, in this case 60, but whatever the cache size is, frames of your uh, texture. Now, this will also work if you have, let's say, a movie file in that is actually a movie. Um, if I just grab one of these, we can see that the texture 3D will also read in an array coming from the movie. So that's helpful to know about. Um, and if you have something like a file, you can use prefill to actually be able to prefill your textures, um, which if I grab another one, set it to a different movie, maybe this one, and pulse my prefill, we can see that it'll just grab the first cache size worth of frames and it'll output a 3D texture uh, or a 2D texture array. Now, the difference between a 3D texture and a 2D texture array are not in the conceptual representation, which is best thought of as a stack of textures on top of each other. So we'll have our XY coordinates that go, you know, your normal UV. And then our Z coordinate is which texture in the stack we're sampling. Um, so to get, I don't know, let's press D. Um, to get to this frame and then this pixel, we would sample the, what would we do? We would sample the, I'm not sure if you can see this in the bottom corner of my screen. Um, oh, this would be the 420th pixel in the X direction, the 306th pixel in the Y direction. And then we would need to grab the actual uh, texture, in this case, that looks like maybe texture 28 or something like that. So we would look that up uh, using X, Y, and Z coordinates to access not only the X and the Y, but then also the slice of the stack that we're going to be looking at. So, wire our block back in here, turn off prefill, and now we can see that we are updating dynamically again. That's great. Uh, now, how does this help us? How this helps us is that we can use a GLSL shader to access all of the, or not all of any, any layer in the stack that we want and any pixel in the stack, or any pixel in the layer, 
that we want um, using our UV. And we can use either the text 3D or the 2D texture array um, to then look up the pixel from a given layer. Now, the difference between using those two uh, inputs types, as I mentioned, is pretty much purely in how we're going to look them up. And I'm going to briefly mention this, but I recommend that you just use the Texture 3D. So if we Google Texture 3D Touch Designer, and we go to our docs, we see here the difference. The difference is that a 2D texture array, whoops, a 2D texture array is much like 3D textures, except they are sampled using a non-normalized W texture coordinate, and they don't support blending between slices. So a texture 3D top we can look up using a value between 0 and 1, and that's going to interpolate between our layers. A texture 2D, we're going to index into using an integer range. And we can interpolate between slices using a texture uh, 2D texture array. Finally, uh, the 2D texture arrays also don't have the concept of a extend mode. So that's just also good to know um, if you know about it. Or sorry, that is good to know about in case you need to use it. So I'm going to use the Texture 3D format in this tutorial, um, although we can potentially look at both of them as we go and see what the differences are. So with that said, I'm going to wire my Text 3D into my out. I'm going to get rid of these two. I'm just going to move them over, actually. We might want our samples. And I'm going to bring... Well, actually, I'm going to leave my block, but I'm going to turn off the pulsing because it's kind of hard to see. So now we just have a block that is translating across the screen, and we're just recording its, uh, its locations as it goes. Now, I mentioned at the beginning that we're going to be using this for a type of feedback technique. Feedback technique uh, was inspired by this concept of chronophotography, uh, which is actually a very old technique from the Victorian era. And what they would do is take a bunch of images and put them side by side to show motion uh, from still images. This was obviously before they had the ability to create moving images. But if you think about it, this is basically exactly what we do anyway. We just create frames that are then viewed in quick succession, and our sensory perception visual sight just interpolates between those frames that we're seeing in a way that looks very smooth. Um, but stuff like this, you can also see chronophotography used to overlay images, and now this looks similar to feedback almost, right? Um, a similar image leaving a trail as it moves across the screen, which is pretty cool. Now, I just kind of came across this somehow um, and thought of the idea. I don't think we want, well, I thought of a cool way to potentially use this to create feedback um, in a method that looks a lot more clean than this and works with our procedural workflow. And that is, in our normal feedback, uh, we do a feedback loop. Uh, feedback loop, middle mouse, press, add feedback, wire that into my out. I will right click, I will add a comp, I will wire this in, I will make the comp add, and then I will drop that on my feedback. And now, uh, what our feedback is doing is adding that frame, the new frame, 
on top of the aggregate of all of the other frames that we've added things onto. If I add some opacity, then we get this fade, and we can see that now we're only getting the last X frames, uh, where X is determined by how much opacity we keep from each frame. But what you end up with is basically a weighted average of frames, right? So you have, because you pass in this texture to our feedback, um, sorry, you pass in this texture to our feedback, which then takes its new sample each frame from the output of the feedback loop. What you're really saying is take the last frame, apply a 90% haircut to it, and then add 100% of the new frame to this value. So you end up with something like a weighted uh, average or addition of values that accumulate over time, where you are, depending on your blend modes, accreting to white or not. Um, you could be subtracting and going down to black, whatever, but the point is, it ends up being kind of like a weighted uh, representation of historical frames, and the only way to really end those historical frames are to use this level. Um, and what I don't really like about this is that it basically results in you having a really bright light at kind of whatever is adding your trail. And then you have a kind of starting to blur, fade out trail that goes off of the end of it. But there's just not really a ton of ways to kind of modulate this. And let's say I wanted the trail to be a lot longer, but to actually stay uh, like with 100% alpha the whole time. How do I do that? Right? You could, I don't know, potentially do something like a threshold after the feedback, um, which I've done before. And then by like using some soften and a threshold, like, okay, now we have a little bit of a longer tail, and you can blur this, I guess. I don't know. This is not really, not really what I like. And then you also just, I don't know, you'd have to like do a comp and then bring the, the color back in, but then you'd kind of have to bring the feedback color back in, actually, because otherwise you don't have... Yeah, okay. I don't really like this. So, um, the point is, we can solve that problem and get long trails that stay crisp the entire time by using a texture 3D. And the way that we'll do that is by looking across our entire array at a given pixel uh, in every layer and saying the value that we want for our resulting out pixel is actually the brightest value of that pixel across all the layers. And what that will do is, if there is a bright value in one of the layers, i.e. if our moving rectangle crossed that pixel in its path, then it'll be filled in, and if not, it won't be. Um, and so this should allow us to have a much more precise crisp trail that will only be as long as our cache length is. So how do we actually go about doing that? Well, we're going to have to use some GLSL. And one interesting thing about the texture 3D top is that, um, where can I find this? three d texture article, so if we go look at three d textures in the documentation, we can see here that there are uh, the fong mat, the time machine top, and the text three d top will support texture three d's as inputs uh, but the g l s l sorry the g l s l mat can also create three d textures. And the feedback top and cache top can support 3D textures as inputs. 
Currently, there are no other pre-made tops or mats that support 3D textures. So this means that we can't, sorry, this means that we can't use a normal GLSL top to work with 3D textures because they're not supported. We have to use a GLSL material to be able to do this. And I will show you how to do that in just a second. Before we do, I'm gonna click on our 2D texture array and just confirm that the only difference between a 2D texture array and a 3D texture is how they're used for texturing. Uh, 3D texture is sampled with normalized zero to one texture coordinates. Supports extend modes such as repeat and clamp and will blend between slices when the U coordinate falls between different slices. 2D texture is not normalized, uses integer indexing for slices and does no blending. Um, also, new information in this page is that a 2D texture array will also support mip mapping when 3D textures don't. We're not going to mip map here, don't worry about it, but good to know in case you do need to know that and or come across it in the future. So, we'll go back to our 3D texture and we'll get working. So because we know that, oops, because we know that we need a Fong mat or a GLSL mat to create our 3D textures, that means that there are also going to be some rendering involved. Now, from my PBR render everything tutorial, uh, I believe that you probably come across this technique that I'm about to show you, but I'm gonna go through it from scratch again. And that is simply using a simple quad to um, render a texture that will allow us to get some material-based effects on just a 2D texture. So I'm going to start with a rectangle. I'm going to actually have this text 3D go right into a null, and then I'll keep this out around here for later. Gonna get a null. Um, I'm going to set the size of my rectangle equal to one and then uh, op single quote Null one, close, single quote, close parentheses, dot height. I'm gonna copy and paste that, go to the end, uh, and then just paste it and change height to width so that I now have a rectangle that will be aspect correct. We may as well pop this guy back in here now so that we can see our aspect correctness working going to create a geo, I'm going to create a camera, I'm going to create a light. And then I'm gonna create a render uh, alt n to drop a null, wire that null into my out. Going to go to my camera, change the view to ortho, change the width to one, and then make sure that my render is also set to the same resolution as my input. So that will be uh, op null one width and op null one height. As we have the render resolution now set to aspect correct as well and our cam on ortho with a width of one, that means that we'll always be looking at a precisely centered and zoomed in rectangle on the screen. Now we can just drop down a fong. We can output our shaders. We don't need the geometry shader, so we can just say okay, delete our original fong, and then drop this material onto our rect. And just like that, I will uh, also just create a select and a null here I'll drop this on 
And actually, I will talk about it before I drop that on. So what, we're, what we have now, just to summarize where we got, is a quad that's just a simple rectangle, one primitive for, for points, for vertices. It's being rendered um, precisely on our screen. And what we're going to do now is use a Fong material, which is really just going to be a GLSL uh, fragment shader, but we have to use inside of a Fong material so that it supports the texture 3D. Um, so this setup is going to allow us to basically do what would be the equivalent of dropping a GLSL in here and saying, you know, like my text 3D stuff here, and then just having the output output. Um, but we can't do that since GLSL tops don't support text 3D inputs, not sure why. Uh, so we're gonna do this instead. We'll move Touch Designer over. I will open up VS Code. I will then edit my Vertex shader and my Pixel shader. Now, don't worry too much. The changes we're about to make are going to be pretty simple for the most part. Um, and if you haven't come across a Vertex shader before, don't worry. We're going to make very minimal edits. So I'm actually going to start there. And just so you guys know, there's this documentation on the derivative wiki called how to write a GLSL material. And how to write a GLSL material is super, super handy for basically everything that I'm about to go through. Um, I figured out how to do all of that by using this documentation. It's pretty extensive. There's tons of different examples and use cases. Uh, so I highly recommend going through this and making sure you're pretty knowledgeable about the entire thing if you're interested in working with GLSL materials specifically. Um, but for today, we're only going to be using a little bit. <clears throat> so one thing that we will need to do is just look at the vertex shader. Uh, maybe we can go to the contents. And find the vertex shader section. So, here, okay, so the input to a vertex shader is all the data about a particular vertex. Um, we get the position, stop space, the texture coordinates, which is very important to us, the color, and the normal. These are called attributes, and they're declared using the in keyword. Um, then it outputs information, which if you think about a rendering pipeline will be output from the vertex shader and be used as inputs to the fragment shader. Um, so that is why if you look at a vertex and a fragment shader, um, maybe I can drag this down here to see both. We'll see our vertex up here has an out vertex struct and our in vertex struct in the fragment shader looks exactly the same. Uh, this is because our vertex shader is actually sending a structure with exactly this information to our fragment shader uh, for every vertex in our geometry. Now, what we need is a way to find the texture coordinates so that we can render this rectangle uh, using our texture input. Um, so if I go to my pixel shader and we see that right now it's setting the color of our pixel equal to ivert.color that means it's the color coordinate coming in from the vertex. We see that the out color is set right here using this TD instance color, TD point color uh, function. So what if we just change that to, 
something like, well, actually, I don't think we want to change it in the vertex shader. Maybe we want to change it in the fragment shader. And here, I will just set our color manually equal to a VEC4 with one in the red and alpha channels and zero elsewhere. So now we can see that our rectangle is being rendered in red. And if I change that to VUV.ST for the first two parameters, which is, you know, in a GLSL shader, how we would grab the UV coordinates to um, sample, we can see that we're getting an error. We're getting an error because we don't actually have the predefined uniform VUV in our material shaders. That is something that Touch Designer defines for you in a GLSL top, which is why you can have something like this line that works just out of the box, even though we never define what VUV is. But we don't have that in our pixel shader as part of material. However, we can access that information um, and send it to our pixel shader using the vertex shader and specifically using the texture coordinates from the vertex shader, grabbing them and sending them through to our fragment shader. Now, how do we do that? We need to know what attributes to grab in the vertex shader to actually send out towards the pixel shader to be using. And in our case, we know that we're going to want texture coordinates um, because that's what UVs are. We see here that we get a pre-declared uniform uh, array, actually, of uh, texture coordinates that has eight total elements. These are pre-declared, which means you don't have to declare them, but we can access them. And I only have one layer of texture coordinates, so I just need the first element of this UV array. So what I can do is go here to my vertex shader, and just in my overt struct, I will have right underneath color, a new vec2 that I will call UV, and that with a semicolon, and this is going to be send text words to frag shader for coloring. Now all we have to do is go down here and actually set our overt uh, dot UV equal to our UV per, uh, uniform array and use the first element of that array by grabbing uh, open bracket zero close bracket and then a semicolon. So then this is going to be grab the text chords from the first element of the pre-declared texture chord uniform array. Now we can use UV in our sh fragment shader. We're still getting an error and that's because we haven't actually passed it in yet. So if we just add a VEC2 UV, uh, sorry, VEC2 UV to our invert structure. And instead of using regular UV, call the UV uh, member of the Ivert struct. Now we can see that our pixel shader is compiling correctly. Uh, although not quite correctly. And that is because, so our pixel shader is compiling correctly, but we actually have an error in our vertex shader. And that is because we cannot convert from a VEC3 to a VEC2. You also notice this layout location equals three temp high P VEC3 aspect in the error. If we go back to our documentation, this looks suspiciously the same as this layout location equals three right here. And we'll notice that the 
uniform array for UV is actually uh, a VEC3. Um, so that was my mistake. We can fix that in two ways. We can either change this to be a <clears throat> two component sampling by simply sampling XY components uh, from that texture coordinate. We can now see that we are getting a nice UV texture on our rendered quad. However, the whole point of doing this in the Fong shader is to be able to use a texture 3D top, which is going to require a three value uh, texture coordinate, right? We need the X and Y for our pixel, and then we need the Z for the slice of our texture array. So I'm actually going to delete that and instead change the UV uh, data to be a VEC3 instead of a VEC2. Um, I will change that also in my iVert structure in my pixel shader. And then finally, I will set this color to be uh, VEC4 iVert.UV.ST. And now we're back to having our nicely uh, laid out UV coordinates here. All right, awesome. So now that we know those coordinates work, I will create a, a VEC2, and I'm gonna call this text sample, and I'm gonna set this equal to ivert.uv.st. And that will allow me to use this text sample to read in some textures from samplers. So first we have to define our sampler. Uh, we will define a sampler called S background, um, and then we'll associate a top to it. So we'll drop this texture on here. Now in my pixel shader, which actually I'm just going to put back up here because we don't need our vertex shader anymore. We can set our color equal to a sample from the uh, sampler. First, by declaring a uniform, this type is going to be sampler 2D, and we'll call it S background. Then we can grab S background, and we can use that in our color assignment in the texture function. So instead of using STD2D inputs like we would normally do, we'll use S background. And instead of using VUV.ST like we would normally do, we will use our variable called text sample. And now we can see that we do indeed have our rendered quad that is being displayed with our dynamically updating texture, which we're sampling through this custom GLSL material using UV coordinates that we are calculating in the vertex shader and passing through into our pixel shader, which is awesome. However, we do not yet have the cool feedback textures. And the reason that we don't have the cool feedback textures yet is because all we're doing now is sampling this one dimensional texture and copying that onto our quad. We need to add another sample and call this S frames and point that at our frame sampler, uh, which I'm going to copy and paste the select, Alt N to drop a null, and I'm gonna call this frame data. I'm gonna drop frame data into the top field for my S frames sampler and then go back to my GLSL. Uh, let's split, nope, split top and bottom. Make this a text port. View the contents of my dat in my text port for some troubleshooting. 
And now we have something good to work with. <clears throat> so, now that we are sampling our color, let's try and sample from our 3D texture. So I'll create another uniform in our shader. A uniform, this time is going to be sampler 3D, and we're gonna call that S frames. You'll notice if you put an S2D instead of an S3D, um, or sorry, actually, if you have the uniform S3D here, but we only give it a two-dimensional regular uh, top, you will, well, should get some warnings. Actually, I'm not sure why there's not a warning appearing here. I think there should be, but that's fine. It doesn't really matter. Um, just be careful that you have a 3D texture pointed at the 3D sampler. And then use the sampler type, sampler 3D. Um, so let's just copy and paste this line, and instead of color, I will have a variable called frame. From there, I will sample the S frames texture. We're getting an error here because there's no matching overload function uh, for the texture function that is being passed a uh, sampler 3D with a VEC2. We would need a VEC3. So we could say VEC3 uh, using our text sample as our X and Y components, and then just using zero as our Z component. And doing that, oops, uh, doing that, we see that we're compiling. And if I put this texture back in here, uh, we can see that if I change this zero to one, then our texture changes. Um, actually, that's not the most descriptive. So maybe what I'll do instead is actually wire in one of these. Images to it. Um, right, because our color is still being set using this. So we can set our color is equal to our frame here. So we can see that appear. Um, and I'll pause this. And now, if we change our zero to one, uh, I guess it won't work if it's paused, whatever. So the rendering won't update. It's kind of hard to tell because it's constantly changing anyway, but you are sampling different layers uh, using a different value here. I think maybe what I want to do is just have three or two two coordinates in my two textures in my cache size. Um, yeah, I think it's going to be kind of hard to really tell, but it's fine if we sample. Yeah, it's like imperceptible. That's okay. Just trust me. Um, you're sampling different things based on our different W coordinates. The reason that this is jumping now is because we're grabbing the texture from our array, um, but we're grabbing this index of our array, so in this case the first texture, which is going to be 60 frames back every frame. Um, so we're like kind of jumping because we're only getting... <clears throat> we are essentially sampling 60 frames ago, um, each frame. What we want to do instead is to actually loop through all of our frames in our cache each frame, and instead of displaying, you know, the first one or the last one, actually display the maximum across all of them. So to do that, we'll need a uniform. That uniform is going to be a vector uniform. We'll call it U 
cash size. I'm gonna customize my parent component and customize the cache size uh, by dragging and dropping that and referencing the parameter. And I'm also going to drag and drop this pulse and set the reference on the source as well. Before I go any further, I'm gonna copy and paste my pulse parameter reference, give it to my text 3D so now I can reset this parameter when I need to. And now we can change our cache size as well as needed. Open these parent parameters. I will drop our cache size onto our uniform and then add it to our pixel shader as a float uniform float u cache size. Uh, so now, in our color calculation, I'm going to change the name of this to actually just call it background, and then I'm going to create another uh, variable called vec4color and set that equal to my background. Then, what we're going to do is create a for loop to loop through all of our uh, slices and keep track of what the maximum value of our pixels across all the slices are and then use that value for our final uh, pixel assignment. So I'm gonna float, I'm gonna define a variable called max as a float. I'm gonna set it equal to negative 10,000. Uh, and then I'm going to define another variable called measure that is also a float and just leave that unassigned for now. My for loop is going to be for a float called i that is equal to 0, 0.0 semicolon space. We will have the for loop run while i is less than or equal to 1. We want it to be less than or equal to 1 so that we sample through all of our slices uh, and then every iteration of the loop, we are going to add 1.0 uh, divided by our u cache size to i. Uh, now we can just say measure plus equals 1 and see what our errors are. Uh, I forgot is semicolon after my less than or equals to one. And after I add that, it looks like things are working. So for each of these iterations in our loop, we are going to sample a VEC3. I'm just gonna name that S. Uh, if you try to name it sample, I believe you will get a error because it is a reserved word. Um, which doesn't actually tell you here, but um, you'll see that if I just change the sample to S, everything compiles, which implies that sample is a reserved word. So anyway, vec3 called S equal to our texture function. This time we'll sample S frames, and we will use a vec3 that has our text sample as our first two coordinates, and then I as our W coordinate. We want to make sure then that we just grab the RGB values of that sample. I don't care about the alpha value because I just want to compare the colors that we're seeing. Um, and then I'm going to have the alpha of the output assigned uh, just to be one. So our measure, measure equals length of S. We'll just take the magnitude of that color. And now, We'll say if our measure is greater than max, we will set the uh, max equal to our measurement so that we then keep track of the current maximum 
and we'll set our color.rgb equal to s. Now at this point, I'm going to wire in the actual uh, thing that we are interested in. Let's see, something kind of weird is happening. So we can try and sort out what's happening there in a second. But for now, I just want to finish our loop here. Um, So I'm going to take, oh there, so I'm going to just remove that other uh, frame variable and remove that color assignment. Um, and so now we can see that this loop is working and we are indeed seeing these cool trails that are appearing uh, by looking at, yeah, the maximum pixel across our most recent, uh, what is our cache size now, 26 frames. So, let me close this and pop back up. And we can see that if we increase the cache size, our trails get longer, but that the trails don't fade out. Uh, they are crisp and clear. I mean, our depth blur is one thing, but for the particles that are close to us, we can see the trails are, are crisp and kind of stay consistent weight and color for the entirety of the trail, and then simply vanish at some point after 84 frames. Um, now, a couple words, I guess, on performance. This is obviously not the most performant method, where this is taking like one and a half milliseconds uh, to run a cache size of 128 and like half a millisecond to run a cache size of 36. This is predominantly because, well, we are sampling for every one of our layers, so that's a lot of samples. Um, and that's also going to scale with our resolution, right? Because we have to make a total number of samples is going to be equal to our width times height times uh, layers. So, you do need to be careful about using this approach with either uh, textures that are super high res. Um, what we're doing right now is Ultra HD, but if I were to kick this up to like 4K, it would definitely start to run a little bit slow on my machine um, because of the resolution. And if I were to kick this up to, I don't know, like, 250 maybe for cache size, and I'll just pulse to reset. We're still running at 60 frames per second, but it is taking like three milliseconds to run just this uh, feedback, which is not great. Um, so you need to be careful and kind of try and find the right balance between resolution and texture size. So as you can see here, if I kick that up to 4K at 36, Cache size, we're at around 2.2 milliseconds. Um, so it's still running, still real time, but about a 4x uh, workload there versus the same cache size on Ultra HD, which does make sense because we doubled the resolution and <clears throat> it is a n-squared, or uh, exponentially proportional calculation that we're doing, since we have to do it for the width and the height. So just be careful and kind of tweak your specific use cases to fit based on, on what you guys are using and what your needs are. But I think this is a super cool technique. I really like it. Um, I just love the, the crisp trails that appear. Um, so I wanted to share that with everybody, and I think it is the perfect application to use here in our feedback uh, particle system. So that is pretty much it for our 
texture 3D feedback. Uh, I'm going to add one additional post. It's going to be pretty quick. So I'm going to add another base. Uh, I'm going to call this uh, maybe perspective shift post and jump inside. This one is going to be uh, essentially just a depth blur that we're going to be faking. So for that, I'm going to drop a Luma Blur, and then I'm going to drop a Ramp. Now, all I'm going to do here is use this Ramp, change it to Vertical, and I'll crank the Luma Blur so you can really see what's going on here. Uh, maybe not quite that high. Um, and let me pulse this so that we are getting, yeah, back to our regular, resolution. Okay, so, I will use the phase to show what's happening. We can see that obviously, because we're using a Luma blur and a ramp, everything that's white is being blurred a lot, everything that's black is being blurred, not a lot. Um, I want to use this to focus on a part of the midground and then blur the foreground and the background in a way that is going to be reminiscent of tilt shift style photography, which is often used in like, I don't know, models and stuff like that. Not a good image. Um, I just want to see the image. Yeah, that has this tilt shift where the near is blurred and the back is blurred and then the mid-ground is sharp. So I'm going to reset this phase to zero and get rid of that key. I'm going to put another key right in the middle and change it to black. Now as I move this key around, um, or if I use the phase to play, we can see that this is allowing us to kind of isolate our perspective. So I'm going to isolate and have the perspective really start kind of right there so that we have <clears throat> kind of the bottom, the second quarter of the image starting from the bottom is where our focal point is. And then I'm going to drop a couple more keys and we can use these to control the fall off. So, if I have another white key up here, and I move that very close to my black key, uh, we can see, you know, right around here, this is kind of where the blur fall off is occurring. And the sharpness, i.e. how close these keys are together, determine kind of whether this looks like a hard line or not. We obviously want it to be like, pretty smooth. Um, but I want the background up here to be the most blurred because that in our perspective is like the most far away. And then I want the midground uh, to be, like I said, not blurred at all. So that's like 100% black as is right now. And then I want my midground, or sorry, my foreground to be just a slightly blurred. I'm gonna turn my Luma blur down to something I think like 30 maybe total. And then, yeah, we can just kind of play with this to get things fine-tuned just how we like it. Um, so you can see, like, if I move this key totally to the end, we have a very quick kind of roll up so that we have some very blurred areas right at the bottom of the image, some very blurred areas up at the top of the image, and then a not quite so blurred area um, in the center. Now, if we go back to our particles and maybe give it some tilt, we can start to see that perspective a little bit more, uh, which I like a lot. 
Then something else that I'm going to do, just to add a little bit of dynamism, is before I do that Luma Blur, I will transform this. I will tra maybe rotate it just like 10 degrees. Extend, hold. And then I'm going to drop a noise and a, whoops, and a displace. <clears throat> I'm going to displace my Luma Blur just a little bit, like a very little bit. Uh, monochrome off, 32-bit float on, displace red and blue. That's fine. Um, make sure these are ordered in the right inputs. And then put this into my Luma Blur. And now, maybe turn my displace weight down even more to something like 0.1. Then turn my harmonics spread down to something a little bit smaller. Make my period a little bit bigger. Turn up my harmonics spread again. And now we just have something a little bit irregular and a little bit, in my opinion, more interesting. Um, the last thing is to use a composite and another level to actually multiply by the inverse uh oh my noise resolution i should just set that noise res using uh the input by changing the output to just noise. Um, oh, our ramp also needs to be set the same way, so make sure you change the output to resolution only for the ramp. And now uh, we can see that this multiplying um, by our inverse of this ramp gives us, whoops, by the inverse of the ramp, gives us this cool kind of focused um, graying out the top and bottom, which really adds to underscore our perspective. So you can play with the transform a little bit since this is all procedural. We could even, if we wanted to parametrize uh, that, in theory, you could also parametrize the translation. Uh, so that could be pretty handy. We may want to allow more displace, um, and then, I don't know, I'm not sure what else we might want. Maybe I'm going to leave it there for now. And so now, if we come back here, I'm going to get rid of these because we don't need that anymore. Uh, we can go on our post and experiment a little bit. We can rotate more or less, you could displace more or less, see that there's more variety coming in there, and maybe something like that's kind of nice. Um, turn our cache size up or down, and we can already start to see this is a pretty cool, crisp, very clean effect with some perspective that is materializing. Um, and this will give us a very good foundation to use, as I said, in the next several tutorials, which will be working with this, integrating attractors, turning it into a project, and doing some very cool stuff uh, to make it your own. So we're going to end here today on that one. Um, thank you to all of my Patreon supporters. It means the world to me. I say this every time, but it's because it's true. Um... It's incredible, it makes me happy, and just motivates me to wake up every morning. So, thank you guys so much, I really can't say it enough. And until next time, I wish everyone good luck and happy creating.